at some point you have to recognize that the problem isn't out there, the problem is you. And that's a hard one for all of us because we don't want it to be our problem. We want it to be something out there that we can buy or get or fix. And the truth is that's been my whole life's work. I unfortunately, uh, one of these days, I'm going to have a one-woman show called, you know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> because I am the poster child for what doesn't work. I mean, how is that? Pretty much everything that I've learned in life has been because I hit a wall, because it didn't work when I was, I left home when I was 16, um, and I did everything that I thought I was supposed to do, you know, I went out and got a job, and I got married, and I basically, when I was 24 years old, I imploded. I, I got married, I got divorced, I lost my job, I had a crappy apartment, I just had no friends, I had no family, and one day I decided to jump out my kitchen window. I thought, I just need to start it all over again, oh, and no. this totally sucks. Now, the bad news was I lived on the second floor of a two-story building, and there was a big bush under my window, and I got to tell you, in that moment, it was more devastating to realize I didn't even have a good exit strategy than the idea that I actually wanted to kill myself. And it was in that moment that I hit rock bottom, and I went, I surrender. I have no idea what to do next. Tears pouring down my face. A lot of people in this lifetime get to that point. Yes, and they it's do. growing and growing and growing. You see self-destructive people so much now who are actually need to be positive, who could be waking, uh, waking up a little bit, you know, and just a, a spark in life will save these people. That's how I look at it. Am I a dreamer or am I imagining things? No, in fact... The spark is all it is. Bang! And that second. And here's the thing. It, every second of the day, we're being given signs. We're being given symbols. We're being given messages. And for me, in that moment, I looked down at the newspaper and there was a little tiny ad about one inch and it said, be paid to travel. Mm. And I thought, oh my God, if, if I could do that, that would be the most astonishing thing possible. And you said this earlier have a lot of dreams, but what sets you apart is you take action. And in that moment, where I was was so awful that I was willing to take a leap of complete faith. I called it up. It turned out to be a school for tour guides. I muscled up my courage. I didn't have the money for the, for the, for the course. I went back to an old employer and I said, I need a job for three months. And this was in 1972 and 74. And I said, and I need to make $15 an hour, mm -hmm. which was, trust unheard me, of. unheard of. I mean, I oh. think minimum wage at the time was like two twenty-five. dollars And she said, what do you want the money for? $3.15 was the, I remember that, $3 was $3.15.75. And she said, what do you want the money for? I said, I want to make this dream come true. And she said, okay. So she gave me a job for three months. I literally ate dinner every single night at a bar that had a happy hour with free hors d'oeuvres. So for the price of a Coke, I could eat cheese balls, I don't know, meatballs, or whatever it was. I probably put on 15 pounds. But I went through the school, I went through the training, and it, it was as if the divine reached down and said, okay, try this, because this is where your heart this is where your heart is leaning. This is what your heart's desire says. <gasps> Be paid to travel. Oh, just even now. And this is like, I'm 62, so we're talking almost 38 years ago. Yeah. I can still feel the chills in that moment going, could this be real? And I wound up getting a job as a tour guide in Atlanta, Georgia. So I, uh, I spent a year traveling around the South and then I parlayed it in and I wound up working for a very tiny beer company called Anheuser-Busch for about 20 years as a corporate event planner and I traveled all over the world. I've been to 17 Super Bowls, I've been to four Olympics, and I've probably been to more NASCAR races than I can shake a stick out of. And in my wildest dreams, my wildest dreams, I never imagined that that tiny little ad would have led to the outcome that it did. But because it was my heart's desire, 
to have that experience mm -hmm. because I was willing in that moment of surrender to ask and expect. And here's the key. We ask for help. We're like, please God, help me out of this mess. But then we don't look for the answer. You know, you've heard, I, I know you've heard the story. So there's this guy and, and the neighborhood's flooded, right? And the policeman comes and knocks on everybody's doors and he says, you know, you got to get out, it's going to be flooded. And he goes, God will take care of me. So the water starts to rise and then pretty soon the fire boats come and they knock on the window and they're like, it's flooding, you need to get out. God will take care of me. <laughs> Finally, the water's up to the roof. He's up on the top of the roof and the helicopter comes by and they drop a line and the bullhorn, get on the helicopter, get on the line. God will take care of me. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, the water rises and he drowns. And he's at the pearly gates, and he's like, come on, I, I've got a bone to pick with you. He said, I was waiting for you to save me, to take care of me, and I'm dead now. And God's like, what do you want? I sent you a cup, I sent you a rowboat, and I sent you a helicopter. People <laughs> does not look at that depth of life. They just see the negative part of what they're facing. Great, and that's why you have me on the show today, because I want to remind people that when God, or the divine, or the mystery, or the greater power of source energy sends you the answer to your prayers, stop asking for how it's supposed to look. Ask yourself, will this save me? Does this light me up? Because remember what you said earlier about perception, we were talking about what we believe versus what was true, your perception of the horses versus the reality of your capacity to communicate. Well, if you say, I want a solution to this problem, then look for what is the solution. But don't say, I only want the solution as long as it looks like it's five foot seven and brown hair and blue eyes. Well, you know what? <laughs> you just opened up a can of worms. For me. <laughs> <laughs> I got my butt shoot about three months ago. Because uh, this lady asked me, she said, what's wrong with me? She said, what are you looking for? I said, somebody who's semi-athletic, not hardcore athletic, somebody who's intelligent, somebody who's intricate in their thinking, somebody who's got, you know, all the things that I, you know, require that somebody needs, you know, like, they have to be solvent, they have to have be outgoing. And she looked at me and she said, well, you're looking for the perfect woman. I said, I'm looking for the imperfect person who has their own belief in it. somebody who can wake up in the morning and make things happen in life. Mm -hmm. And if you had that person, what would that get for you? That would be a lot of faith and confidence in that person because, you know, as you get older, you want somebody who can help you take care of yourself. That's the whole thing of it. You okay. don't want somebody who's going to flake out on you. So if you had somebody who could take care of yourself, you had somebody that you trusted, that you knew would be there for you, what would that get for you? That would probably prolong a lot in my life. Okay, and if you had a prolonged life, what would be the best part of that? I could go on drag race until I'm 99 years old. <laughs> okay, and if you were out there drag racing until you were 99 years old, what would be even more important about that? The important thing that I would look back in life say, thank you God for the ride. And if you were able to look back at your life and know in your heart of hearts that you truly had things, what would that give you? That would give me a feeling of passing in peace. Right. And right there is what you're looking for. And you have an idea of what the package looks like. You're looking for the athletic or the solvent or whatever, but what you really want is someone that you can live your life with that brings you a sense of peace. Say that again. It's like what you're really looking for is to find a partner in your life that brings you a sense of peace. Wow. You just blew my shit away part of my face. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops, I hope they don't beat that one. So the truth is, is that in your mind, going back to the horse analogy, your perception is in order to get that, it has to have all of these attributes. But well, in you figure a person who's athletically inclined then, somewhat, they live longer. Well, okay. You know, they're more, they're more and, structured mentally. And how many athletic people out there wind up having cancer and dying at 32? See, that, that's what people do. They say, I, 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 they never take it deep enough. They don't, they don't say, what I'm looking for is peace. What they say is, I'm looking for the package. I had never thought of that concept in life until you said what you just 
blew my stuff out, lady. Yeah, that's why I get the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> you deserve them. I mean, my husband and I, we've been married, um, we've been married 15 years, we've been Say together 18. He's, he's a pretty awesome guy. Um, I, I met him over 30 years ago. His dad actually married my mom, um, and but we didn't see each other for like 30 years. And when my mom uh, was dying, him and I connected. And, and if you were to see the two of us together, we're very different people. I'm, I'm an introvert. I, am, I, I love Idaho because I get to be alone, I get to be out in nature, I'm with my animals. My husband is an extreme extrovert. He's the first person at the party, he takes the trash out before he leaves. He is so friendly and so sociable. He's really almost everything that I'm not. But when you drill it down, we share identical values. We are, at our core, so alike that even though we present very differently, I trust him with my life. Because trust is a big word. It is for me, it yes. is for him, and I feel safe. And when I'm with my husband, regardless of the circumstances, I know that I'm safe. And for me, safety was not uh, a given in my life. I, I did not have a safe childhood. So to have someone in my life that meets that need. Now I could say, oh yeah, I want him to be six foot two and I want him to have big brown <laughs> eyes, which of course he is. But the truth is what I want is to know that when I'm with the love of my life, I am as safe as I could possibly be. You know what? I've only had one time that happened to us with my mom. I, daily she told me that she loved, she died at 32. I'm so sorry. You know, and you know back then she hit her head and it developed into a tumor. They didn't know what, 53, 54. You're listening to Thoughts of the Child's Achieve Williams on Radio Valencia, the Sounds of the Mission. And, and we're back with Shannon Preston. And we're having one hell of a... I want to say something to you. We're not a cookie-cutter show here. We don't uh, write 10 questions down and follow the questions. I see a lot of radio shows and a lot of people, they write a script. We don't write scripts here. We go for the gust of the gullet, as they say. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I love that. I love the opportunity to show up and see what wants to happen. And right. That, that to me, is, is the invitation to the mystery. It's like, hey, it's always a prayer when I walk in. I always, I talk to my special guides and I say, okay, lovelies, bring it on. You know, let's see what interesting things are going to happen today. And so I feel really, really happy to be here and, and, uh, and see what's being revealed. Well, you know, uh, I run my mouth a lot, but I learned a lot. And um, people, uh, again, are uh, my thing in life. When life is over, I just want to look back and say, thank God, you know, no regrets. I know a million people, and you know, uh, that's about it. You know, James Lipton, when um, he does the actor studio interviews, I don't know if you've ever seen him on TV, but he always brings in these beautiful celebrities and talks about their experience acting. And one of the questions that he asks in the end is, when you die and you meet God, what do you want him to say? You know, what do you, what do you want to say? What, what do you want him to say to you when you, when you get up? And, and to me, whenever I think about that, you know, I, I think of that old Jewish proverb when, when the rabbi goes to God and, and the rabbi realizes that God's mad at him because he spent his whole life trying to be like Moses, trying to be like the Holy God, but he never tried to be like himself, you know, and God says, you know, Shusha, why were you not Shusha? You know, you tried to be Moses, you tried to be the great holy ones, but, but why were you not Shusha? And so your capacity to be yourself, to do this great radio show, to bring not the cookie cutter, but to bring the true stories to your audience, that's you being the most authentic you. And then when you die, it's kind of like God said, good job, buddy, good oh. job. Mm, interesting. I love that, you know, and the fact that uh, I was talking to, uh, I was conversing with somebody named Karen. I won't give them the last name. And they, they, they took the whole concept of the communication wrong. 
you know, I'm, I'm not out there to, to go after anybody, you know, physically, anything like that. But I, I like getting deep with people because, you know, I like digging into people. That way, that's how you learn. And I dig very well. So what's your, what's your, what do you want to dig for? Let's, let's go deep. To show people that they can do anything they desire and anything they dream. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think sometimes people say, you know, what, I always have trouble with the, you know, what do you do? Um, because for me, it's it's almost a deer in the headlight question. What do you do? Well, well as little as possible. That's my motto. Um, but in my heart of hearts, I feel like a wish fairy. And the question that I always ask people is, what is it that you wish for? What in your in your quietest moments when you think to yourself, oh, if, if I could have this? And again, the deepest question isn't, well, let's go make this happen. The question is, who oh, getting that get for you? And I'll give you a perfect story for this. I had a client who came to me a long time ago. She uh, she wanted to double her income. So she she had been a business consultant for a pretty long time, and she'd been making the same amount of money and over and over. And so she had this belief system that this was the most amount of money that she could ever make. So she, she got referred to me by someone, and she said, I, I want to double my income. It's like, okay. So if we double your income, what will that get for you? Well, then I could I could spend less time commuting, I could buy my house in the country, I could start to travel, I'd make all this money, I'd, uh, I'd marry my boyfriend, I'd raise chickens, blah, blah, blah. She had all these things she wanted to do that was contingent on her making double her income. So I said to her, I said, okay, well, what if, rather than focus on doubling your income, why don't we focus on getting you what you want and see where that takes you. Cut to three years later, she not only married her boyfriend, she got her house in the country, she became a travel writer, she wrote four books, she made more money than she'd ever made in her life, but she didn't focus on doubling her income, she focused on getting what she wanted. And sometimes when people say, well, I just want a better job, or I just want to make so much money, or I want to have that perfect relationship, I always have to ask the question, what would that get for you? Very much like I asked you. Well, if you had the perfect person, what would she get for you? Well, I'd have peace. I'd have peace. And it's like, well, great. Let's work on getting you peace and see where that takes you. And that's the biggest obstacle, I think, in my belief system to why people's dreams don't come true is because they don't understand why they want the thing they want. So they try and get that thing, but once they get it or don't get it, they don't get the thing they truly want. You know, uh Getting older, the things that you you you, uh, you want to like move closer to reality than dream world. I still dream that I can do this. Uh, I bought and sold five houses in the last two and a half years. You know, and people say, "Well, oh my God, that's a feat!" No, 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 no. It's a small thing because it's not part of life itself. It's an it's an accomplishment. Yes, that's the how I look at it. I have accomplished that. But my real accomplishment, like you said, is to have somebody I can feel peaceful with and safe. Mm -hmm. Those are the two things, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, uh, one lady told me the other day, she said, what about this intelligence thing? I said, I want somebody that when something happens in life, uh, like the news, uh, computer service, uh, this and that, uh, I want somebody to be able to teach me that. Well, she said to me, a man's ego jumps in. She said, I'm not hearing where your true ego is. I don't even know what that means. Me neither. <laughs> so, I mean, if somebody said that to me, I'd say, tell me more about that. You know, yeah. because I, I realize I don't know. I was baffled. So here's an interesting thing. We, as humans, um, are in love with our language. It doesn't matter whether you speak English or German or Dutch or Farsi, we're in love with language. We consider it to be one of, besides opposable thumbs, we consider it to be one of the grand uh, attributes of humanity. But here's the interesting thing. Less than 10% of all communication that happens is verbal. 90% of all wow. communication is through your heart and your gut. It's through your body. It's through your energy. It's through the vibration of your actions and your intentions. So when we listen to what people are saying, but we're feeling 
again, remember we're talking about authenticity and congruency. Mm -hmm. So you're with someone, you're with a woman, and you're talking about the things that you truly love. That's fine. You know, the mind is a great tool. I always think of the mind like a, a drill, okay? But if you want to build an awesome house, you need an architect. Sure. So your heart and your gut is the architect, and your brain is the tool that makes those things manifest. You know, I want to say something to you. You're, you're opening up another... Uh, <laughs> another can of worms. Okay. Uh, one, one of the things that I have, I have heard a lot of women say... And the men, let's talk about you know your perception of men out there. And you know, race has no no bearing on it. A man is a man. He's either a jackass or he's halfway decent. He's one of the two. Okay. Well, that's certainly one way of looking at it. Well, you know, that's being truthful. You know, women. Uh, I I talk to so many women, and I don't know why it's a lot of women, but they do talk to me. You know. <laughs> Excuse me. And they come up with some stuff that just. Just borrows me, and I tell them, you better go find a professional. <laughs> I tell them, I'm a quack. I'm a real quack. I'm not a phony quack. You know, if it hurts, cut it off. You know. <laughs> yeah. So I, some of the things I, I hear from the men is uh, insecurity across all racial and race barriers and age barriers in our society in great numbers right now. That macho thing and that emotional thing that they display cover their real feelings is a big thing with women today. Uh, you know, they get to the point where they'll start yelling to cover their true feelings or they'll do something that, you know, throws the woman off. You know, what do you say to the man population out there and the great numbers who are living in this, uh, this world that they think they're in and machoism and that stuff that they preach and teach right now to each other and the lack of faith and confidence in, in themselves and society and their friends around them is what do you say to people like that? How do you open up the light to tell these people that there's a better world than that? Well, I don't know that I would tell them anything, but I would certainly ask them, what are you afraid of? That, that's a big question. It is a big question because if you look at the perspective. Fear is, is the one, one thing that destroys it. There's two, two mediums in life that I learned from this lady, uh, one of many ladies, but uh, uh, two things I learned. Fear and love are like the revolving, you know, little gear that goes back and forth. Well, actually, they're, they're, not, they're not opposite sides of the coin. Um, really? In, in, my, in my world, in my belief, love simply is. There's, there's no opposite of, of love in terms of love simply is. Some love. men fear loving. Okay, but I don't think they fear loving. Okay. They fear something else and they believe that love will cause the thing that they fear. So if you say that again. Okay. So if somebody says, I'm afraid to fall in love. It's like, okay, so what's what's so fearful about falling in love? Well if I fall in love, I'll I'm out of control. Okay? So What's the worst part about being out of control? Well, if I'm not in control, I, 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 I'll be stupid. It's like, okay, so what's the worst part about being stupid? Well, then people will know I don't know anything. And it's like, okay. And I they hear do. that a lot from guys. Right. So here's the interesting thing. Again, it's a little bit like peeling the onion. And that's, again, why coaching, I think, is one of the most powerful things and gifts that you can give to yourself is we don't take it far enough because we're inside the box. You know that old statement, it's hard to read the label when you're inside the jar? Right. So if you tell yourself, love scares me, I'm afraid to fall in love, and that's the story that you're telling yourself. So this is, this is a, the element behind this macho bullshit thing that they live, is fear. Well, I think it's the element behind all of us in some capacity that the reason we don't live our most authentic self is because we're afraid that who we are as we are isn't good enough. Wow. Okay, Damien, uh, I just answered your question. Okay, I hope I hope you're listening to me today. You said you were going to Damien from San Pablo. I 
I asked, I, your question has been asked, okay, I hope you, you got the answer. So fear, so, define fear for me. Well, when you're afraid, what do you do? When I'm afraid, I go challenge it. I'm gonna do this to hell, come hell out of water. Okay, so, so let's just go back to your belief around women, around finding the perfect mate. So for you, the perfect mate has a set of parameters. But we've already it's not perfect. Nobody's perfect. I right. understand that. But we've already defined that at the core, what you want is someone that makes you feel safe, right? Yeah. Okay. So if you think about what it feels like to be safe, just to, just imagine that in your body right now. Kind of, you know, we're in radio, so it's not like TV. You have to watch the cameras. So just close your eyes for a minute and think of a time in your life when you were totally safe, when you knew that who you were as you were, was okay. You want me to, now this is going to blow you away, okay? I was on, underneath the rock car. You know what rock cars are? These are the cars that drop gravel on the, on the train track. Oh, right, okay. And underneath there's a little shelf. I only weighed 145, 155 pounds back then. Maybe 150. But I felt safe riding on this thing, and you tie your belt around the airline, Nobody can see you, mm -hmm. nobody can hear you, mm -hmm. and it's hard to get to you because, you know, most people are big and fat out there on the, you know, the train police, they were big. I felt totally safe. Great. And I slept there. Okay. I, you know, and I could hear the cadence of the, the wheels on the train, and I slept there. That was, I felt so safe being underneath that 80 miles an hour. Great. So think about that moment of feeling totally safe, even at 80 miles an hour, and feel what that feels like in your body. You can breathe, your chest is probably expanded, your fingers are relaxed, there's no tension in your legs, your belly is probably relaxed. Now, think about something that scares you. I mean, honestly, you don't even have to tell me what it is, but think about something that really scares you. Maybe being stuck with a woman that doesn't make you feel safe for the rest of your life. Wow. Okay? What changes in your body right now? What do you notice? Well, um, uh, you know, I, I spent 40 months in Vietnam, and fear kind of just didn't, don't dwell in me as far as fear is concerned. Expectations is my big thing. Okay, so expectations. So all of a sudden now you've got a lot of expectations. Where do you feel the tension in your body? What do you notice between in my you? neck? Okay, so your neck is starting to feel yeah, tight. Yeah, and my shoulders. Your shoulders. Yeah. What else? And I don't sleep. Okay, so that sensation, the tight neck, the tight shoulders, the insomnia, there could be other physical sensations, very different from when you were talking about that moment of safety where you sure. were relaxed and everything's comfortable. So which one feels better for you? Going back to the trains. Right, going back to that safe space. Well, for most of us, being in that place of comfort is a place you think we would want to be in all the time. But when we start thinking about something that, that makes us uncomfortable or whatever, and we tense up and we tighten up, it's actually because we're trying to protect ourselves so that we can go back to feeling safe. But it's a little like that Chinese finger puzzle. Remember those puzzles as a kid, you stick your finger sure, in, the more a, you pull, the yeah. tighter it got? Yeah. So in actuality, we would be better off to pay attention to how to replicate that safe space. But instead, we tighten up. And the act of tightening just makes it worse. You know, uh, I have seen an analyst, you know, and the guy looked at me, he says to me, he says, so, what are you feeling right now? I said, I need a hamburger and a little fries <laughs> and a shake, you know. And I, and I told him, I said, a shot of Jack Daniels would be good right now. <laughs> is that, just that, the food coma. I'm looking for the food coma. A little bit of alcohol. What is that? A bit of what was that? Because that's nourishment. That's that place that it's like when I have a hamburger and I have some french fries and I have a little jack on the side. Can't you just feel your body just going, yeah, okay. You have no idea how that made me feel no, in the evenings and, to do that. And, and in that moment, when that analyst said that, it's because something was touching you that felt uncomfortable, that felt tense, and your desire to get back to relaxation. So here's the thing with horses. So a horse out in the field, right, 
and he notices that another horse down the field's got his ears up and he's got a little bit of tension going. And because he's a prey animal and it's very important for him to recognize the signs of his herd members, decides that there's a lion in the grass, maybe a bobcat or something. They all raise their heads, their ears go back, they and they, they all look at the same direction right. at one time. And then off they go. And a horse will run as far and as fast as he needs to, only as far and as fast as he needs to until he is out of danger. And then he goes back to grazing. Uh -oh. What he doesn't do is what we do as humans. He doesn't look back at the field and see that plastic bag suddenly take flight and float through the... Oh my god, I can't believe I was just a bouncer back. I'm so stupid. I can't believe I freaked out and went running across the field. Over. But we see the danger. We take action. But we don't go back to grazing. We live that moment over and over and over again. And we don't even remember 20 years later, what freaked us out 20 years ago, we just have the muscle memory of when this happens, I got to do that. And that's what we as humans need to learn how to backtrack from, how to get back to that original scary moment, process it, understand it, and let it go. So how do you convince the, the male mind of so many out there living with so much fear and they're they're miserable that 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 little element of getting back to be feeling safe will help them with everything how do you get them to make that bridge well quite frankly i can't get anybody to do anything they have to do it themselves you, no, right? no no they don't have to do it themselves they just have to want it uh -huh. they have to say I don't even know what the problem is. I just know that it's in me, not outside me. That is it. So here's the thing. People say, okay, so what do I need to do to make my dreams come true, right? Yeah. So I believe there's four stories in the world that we all tell. So the first one's the challenge story. Where are you in your world right now? What's working? What's not working? What do you want? What's What's the thing that keeps you up at night? What's the thing that's got your knickers in a twist? Okay, that's the challenge story. And we all have one version of it. Second story is the dream story. What do you want? If everything was exactly the way you wanted it to be in your perfect world, what would it look like? What would it sound like? What would it feel like? Who would be there? Who, what, where, when, why, and with whom? Okay? So here you are with your challenge. Here's your dream story. The first thing you have to do is clearly articulate it. You've got to actually know, at least in some capacity, what that dream story looks like. You know, the famous story about the woman that goes to the travel agent and she says, I want to go on vacation. The travel agent says, awesome, where do you want to go? And she says, I don't know, somewhere hot, and dry, and sandy. <laughs> and so the woman sends her to Burning Man. You know? <laughs> you said hot, dry, and sandy. But what she didn't articulate was she also wanted that little drink of the umbrella and an ocean on Beach, the other side yeah. of that sand. So pieces get left off because we just assume. We think people are mind readers. Is the male mind, is the male mind, is it a habit for so many males in our society to think the same way? I have no idea. Do you think it's a habit for them to think? I don't know what the what the connection is, and that's why I ask you. Well, I think that I think that everybody has a challenge, and everybody has a dream. So the first thing we have to do is actually articulate the dream a little bit more clearly. But the third story is the one that gets everybody in trouble because the third story is the yeah but story. You know, it's like, well, I can have what I want, but you know, if only. What do you call you know, the yeah but? The yeah but. You know, the yeah but story <laughs> is you know clutter, and it's you you. You know you should be sitting down to make your phone calls, or you know you should be following up, but you find yourself watching cat videos on YouTube, or you know, end endlessly scrolling your email to see if somebody will write you something that isn't a solicitation. And so, we we look at the yeah but story again, going back to that metaphor with the with the uh, the iceberg. You're in the boat. You want to get to your destination, but there's the iceberg, and you crash into it. But the truth is is that yeah but story, the thing that you think it is, the clutter, the overwhelm, the you know, nobody, nobody out there is perfect for me, nobody's gonna give me the job I want, whatever the story is, is the tip of the iceberg. And underneath that, 
Joseph Campbell said it perfectly, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. The thing you say are... Say that again. No, no. Say that one more time. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Wow. So the thing that you're most afraid of, the thing that you have the biggest fear, the biggest resistance to, the biggest hesitation for, holds the gold. And so people say, well, how do I get in the cave? How do I enter it? How do I conquer it? You know, and I always tell women, you gotta go in there and you gotta take your tiara back from that dragon. You know, you're gonna have to go to the underbelly of the beast and you're gonna have to claim that for yourself because everything you want is on the other side of the thing that you're convinced will kill you mm -hmm. if you go there. Now here's the fourth story. Okay, so you got the challenge story, you got the dream story, you got the outlet story. There's a fourth story, and I know that you have lived this story. I know this story is alive in you mm -hmm. in so many different ways, and I call it the unexpected story. And the unexpected story isn't a story that we write, okay? It is our partnership with something greater than ourselves. It is the thing that prefaces with, in my wildest dreams, I never imagined, fill in the blank, you know, Steve Jobs, in his wildest dreams, I don't think he ever imagined that it would be J.K. Rowling when she wrote Harry Potter. I mean, there's just example after example. And the, and the thing is, is that the only way the unexpected story is revealed to you is if you go in the cave and you recognize that your dream is not on the other side of the rainbow. It is right in front of you, and you are wearing the ruby shoes, and you need to learn to click them and own it. Wow. Okay. My F-type Jack. Come on, baby. Give me something to the thoughts of the common man that Charles achieved for you. On radio, Valencia, the sounds of the mission. And we're back again with Shannon. And uh, I, we, were, we were sitting here talking about just all kinds of stuff. Stuff, would you call it stuff? Stuff, stuff. Yeah. stuff. stuff. Life you know, stuff. One, one of the things that, uh, uh, one thing that happened to me uh, two years ago, I lived on West Street in, in uh, West Oakland. And uh, I, I came out one, one day, and I, I was pretty well, feeling pretty good. And here is a 22-year-old beating the hell out of his girlfriend, which was visibly, visibly six and a half, seven months pregnant. And I grabbed my baseball bat out of my truck, and I, I approached him, and I said, I'm going to knock your head off. And I was, I was very angry. And he, I, and I told him to keep his hands out of his pocket, because if he went for his pockets, I was going to bust him up real bad. I was, I was visibly angry. And I said to him, I said, why are you doing this? He said, she's going to have a baby that I don't want. Mm. And there is a lot of that. you know. And I said to him, but you made it. And it's an extension of you right now. This is three years ago, okay, because I've been where I am almost two and a half years. And I saw them two weeks ago. And they're married, making the second one. And I was so uh, outdone and very, uh, I got emotional, I'll tell you that. I said, what happened? He said, I don't know. And she said to me, he loves me and he couldn't, he couldn't open his heart and open his mind to the fact that he, he, he loved me. And I said, where did the anger come from? She said, we never figured that out. She said, but we're doing very well right now. We have an apartment by ourselves down the street. That's a success story. But there are so many horror stories out there today. You know. And the other thing was that uh, when I was asking questions, 65% of the minorities in colleges right now are women. And only like 41% are men. That's a big, that's a big gap. So what is happening in our society today that you see? that this gap is widening, where women are becoming more successful. Even women are going into the cabinet, into the uh, corporate world right now. They're breaking the glass ceiling. Women are moving and shaking. And 
the man population that all races kind of waning a little bit. What do you see in that? Well, it's, I had to put that one on you. That's been on my mind all morning. Well, it's a big question, and I I want to qualify it by saying I'm, I'm not a therapist. I understand um, that. I. But you have an idea. Maybe you have an opinion. Well, yeah, I, I certainly have an opinion. That's an opinion. We opinions. go on the opinion. Let's factor. go on okay. with the opinion. So okay, we go on the opinion of the of the speaker. Um, you know, there's a couple things that come to mind for me, and one of them is an idea um, that kind of predates Christianity, I think, which is around queens and consorts, and when women, certainly in earlier religions, matriarchal religions where women were revered and honored, um, the men were their consorts. They were consort defined consorts. Um, kind of the equal, like like the balance of power, love, and wisdom. In to use the horse metaphor again, in herds, uh, there is a lead mare and there's a lead stallion, and the lead mare is in charge of setting the direction for the herd. So she's out in front, and her job is to set the direction and to bring the herd. Um, on his journey. And the stallion is in the back. And his job is to see the big picture and to hold the safety of the group. But they work in tandem. They're not they're not mutually exclusive. It's not like the stallion, you know, runs everything and, and in fact when a stallion gets a little bit too overly aggressive with the females, the females kinda of put him back in his place. And like, hey buddy, back off. So if we look at culture, we look at um, where we are today, women have traditionally been, and, and in many parts of the world, quite honestly still are, um, second class citizens. Their power has been taken away from them. They are not respected. They are not, uh, they're in danger. They're, I mean, we're lucky in Western culture that women um, have the opportunity to to stand in our power because in a lot of places in the world, that's not a reality. But the interesting thing is, is that as women get stronger, why do men feel threatened? You know, what is it about a strong woman that makes a man feel threatened? I don't have an answer to that, and I don't even really have an opinion about it, but I can tell you from my perspective that in a relationship like my own marriage, my husband has gifts and talents. And I have gifts and talents. And he does the things he's extraordinary at. And I do the things that I'm really good at. And then the stuff that we're both crap at, you know, we kind of trade off and, and we do either one. But the question that I would ask your listeners, your male listeners, again, goes back to that place of what is it you're afraid of? What is it that you're that afraid of? That's why I, I was invading you, okay? Uh, I, yeah, I was. I was. <laughs> Well, I, I got I got to confess to that one. Okay. I baited you on that one. Because. I, I just want to see if you want to come back to the same point. It's <laughs> it, it's always the same point. It's always what we're afraid of, and it's it's we forget we forget love, and we feel the fear. We don't want to be vulnerable because what if we're vulnerable? We're not safe, and most of us in the world want to be safe. We want to feel peace. We want to feel loved. We want to feel respected. But when that doesn't happen, remember what we were talking about, our bodies, we start to tense up. We start to feel the, the tension in our bodies. We don't know how to get back to that safe place. And then all of a sudden, see, for most of us, if you look back at your childhood, there's a moment in your in pretty much everybody's childhood, when you weren't safe. And maybe for some people it was an ongoing thing, or maybe for some people it was an instantaneous moment. But in that moment, when you're young, and you don't have a lot of resources, yeah. and you don't have a lot of power, you're going to make the best choice, the best decision you can, given the circumstances. So in any given moment, you're going to do the best you can with what you have to work with. The problem is, is that when we're young and we don't have a lot of resources, we take actions, and those actions keep us alive. Good, bad, right, wrong. We wake up every day, and our unconscious goes, hey, Shannon, are you still here? It's like, yeah, I'm still here. I'm right on. Must be doing something right. 
And so that part of us, the part that came up with the strategy that kept us alive, kind of takes a little bit of ownership and goes, hey, you know, when this happened back there, I did this thing and it worked. So we're going to keep doing this thing over and over and over again. And what it requires of all of us is a pause. And to ask the question, is this thing that I'm doing, this strategy that I've developed over time, getting me what I want? And where it falls apart is nobody takes the question down far enough like you and I did, which is what would finding the perfect relationship get for you and get me peace? So the question has to be, this thing that you're doing over and over and over again, is it actually giving you what you want? And what we truly want is peace, safety, security, and love. But we don't have any dialogue in this culture for that inquiry. And if we're never taught it, how do we, how do we know that it works? You know? Well, you know, one of the things that I, I see uh, in the male bastion, I'll call it, okay? Is that a good word? Jackass world, you know, however you want to say it, is that, uh, again, we're going back to fear and insecurity. We're right back where we started. Am I right? Yeah. And you know, the thing about it is that it does not have to be that way. Uh, a lot of people don't come up with uh, two parents. This is a, a world now where the, the female single parent element is quite prolific in our society. And it's growing. You know, there are way more men of all races in prison than there are women right now. Uh, you know, the parody is right now that women are raising boy kids and they're trying to do the best they can and there's no man in the house. This is in the, in the ghetto community. You know, the man in the house is, um, in a lot of cases, just not there. And they don't care to be there because they don't want the responsibility. And it goes back to what you're saying, fear. So if you just about answered all of my questions that I've thrown at you, kind of with a little quasi cover, with a little quasi mask, okay? You asked, and now I'm going to say to guys out there, you know, just be yourself. And you know, the hell with the fear thing. Because if that's what's holding you back, they're not going into the tunnel as you say. Am I right about that? Well, I, I think it's, it's certainly a place to start. Um, you, know, you have to start with you first, you, not not the woman uh, or your problems. Absolutely, have to start with yourself. You, you you are the problem. You know, I'm, I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you. I had a father, and he was like a rock to me. And whenever I take off and be gone for six, seven, eight months, nine months, he come back. He'd beat the daylights out of me. We'd both cry in the yard, and he'd come in. He'd patch me up. You know, tell me that he loved me. You know. And, but I did the same thing all over again because I, I just had to get out there. I, once I got to that life, I was comfortable out there on the road. And uh, once I got out there, and you know what, what culminated the whole thing was a guy I was in, uh, I was in uh, uh, Sedona, Arizona, and I ran into a guy I hadn't seen on the road for a long, about eight months. He told me, go back and do it during the military, you'll be happy. Was he right? He was right. And what was it about the military that made you happy? I got the hell out of here because I don't believe, I, I, I don't look at things like most people. There is a world out there and I want to see what that world is, you know, and that world changes people. The people that I, uh, my kids grow up on military bases and the mindset of the children, you know, they all made A's and B's, you know, they were very competitive, you know, they, were, they had been around, lived in different foreign countries. And when you look at our society today, our society is a small little petri dish with the flame in the middle of it, as I see it. And we're self-destructive because we don't open up and the mind does not grow. Gangland, gangland America is very violent. Gangland America is nothing but just pure destruction. And it does not have to be. Because when you don't open your mind up and look and see what other people are doing and grow from these people, in my belief, this is the way you start.
with Charles Achieve Williams on Radio Valencia, the sounds of the mission. We're, we're going to go back a little bit here, and we're going to go back to the the queen and the contour. Is that what we're looking at? <laughs> uh, well, the queen is out front as an orchestrative individual, but the stallion is also in the background as an orchestrating and protector and evaluator. His role is twofold because what if we had that concept in the human, in our human way of life, we understood that, that would alleviate a lot of problems. Am I right? Well, I, I think we were. We, were we accept that. That concept of co creative leadership? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Here we have uh, dominance in our society, which is a destructive element as far as I'm concerned. We see that in our current administration right now. We have we have a very top down, my way or the highway dominant political structure, and it's it's very harmful because it does it's not inclusive. It's right. we're, we're we're leaving out some of the best. Um, you know, we were talking about you and Gina and what great partners you were, and both of you bring your unique gifts and talents and it makes it work and you enjoy being in relationship because you're not dominating one or the other. And I think I think the you know the, the metaphor we were using is you were saying if anybody did something to Gina, you beat them up. Sure. And the difference between patriarchal top down management is to look at Gina and say, if you do something wrong, I'll beat you up versus that co-creative partnership relationship, which is, I'm going to protect what that we word, have. That word, co-creative, is huge. It's enormous for me. It's enormous. It's enormous for anybody. In our society, it, it does not equate in a lot of people's minds. Because co-creative is a feminine, okay? It's right. a feminine attribute, engagement, co-creation, collaboration. It's not that women have um, a lock on it because we all have masculine and feminine traits. So maybe right. we come up with a different name for it so that we don't, people don't, oh, I don't want to be masculine or I don't want to be seen as feminine. But the truth is, is that in balance, okay, in balance, we have both. We have our assertive, we have our creative, we have that, that outward energy, the, you know, having the goals, setting the goals, but then we have that nurturing, we have that creative, we have that engaged process that allows us to collaborate and come together. And when we're out of balance, when we have too much masculine, we can't relate, we can't engage. And if we have too much feminine, where, oh, we're just, you know, we want to take care of everybody, then we get into codependence, and then we get into submissiveness, and then we don't take our brilliance out in the world. So many women that I know say, oh, you know, I'm not good enough. I don't, you know, everybody else is doing it so much better than me. And, you know, the French philosopher, I, I forget his name, but he's basically said, everything that's ever been said has already been said. But nobody was paying attention. So we have to say it all over again. You know what, I, I, I'm listening to you, and the two people I spent the entire weekend with, every time he spoke, he said, Dumplin', what would you like to do today? That was his thing. Every day I listened to Mr. Ross. He said, Dumplin', what would you like to do today? Uh, Dumplin', what, what can I do for you today? Right. And did not that which, in any way diminish him? No. Absolutely not. But see, not. here's the psychology of it all. This is a man who is very comfortable in his own skin. Exactly. And the more comfortable you are in your own skin, the more you can open your heart to allow others. It, it's like you give people this, the gift of grace when you don't put yourself on them. You don't make them responsible for you. You take responsibility for yourself. You take ownership for your own issues. It gives you gives your heart so much room for expansiveness, and that's a beautiful thing. If you would ever see this house they live in, and she's collected thousands of artifacts and you know, stuff like this over the years, and you know, from places like uh, garage sales, she looks, she's very intuitive in, in looking at things, and she buys things too, but she, her, her thing is to enjoy herself in her space. 
and he gives her that space. What a gift. You know, what, what a gift. And here we go back with the macho bull stuff that, you know, we live in today. Is the man has to say, I'm the man, you the woman, you're subversive with me. That is destructive as far as I'm concerned. Well, it's, yeah, absolutely. It's destructive in any relationship. You yeah. know, even your best buddy, if you told your best buddy, hey, you got to do everything I say. I mean, yeah. what's the fun in that? But the opposite of that, or, or not the opposite, but look at what he gets. He gets a beautiful home. He gets a place to be comfortable, to be himself. So he's giving. Right. He's supporting. Right. He's also receiving. The receiving same. part is the man, most, most men of color don't understand that element of receiving. They have to emulate something that does not exist without all this macho crap thing they have in, in their repertoire. You know, and they, they, they're, they're over demanding. Receiving is, is, is challenging sometimes for all of us to receive love, to receive acceptance, to receive peace. Because we want it so badly that we're afraid if we get it, then someone will snatch it away from us. And the pain of having it snatched is so great that we would just assume push it back and not have it. Well, you know, uh, I, I grew up with the fact that I was looking at Walt Disney and said, wouldn't you wish upon a star, you know, yeah, take bell. Remember that? Yeah, we yeah. Had. Makes no difference who you are. Yeah. We, we in the black community, we in the minority community have lost that star. You know, that's, that's, that, is that a simple way of putting it? You know, we've lost that star. We've lost the fact that, you know, that um, when you, your heart feels good and you're comfortable, and the fact that the woman makes you feel secure, you know, you don't. It's a very cheap price to pay at some yeah. points in life. Am I right? Well, I think the analogy that I think of is when you say we lost the star. You know, if you go outside right now, it's it's almost noon. If you go out and you look at the sky, you can't see a star except for the sun. Right. But for the most part, there's no stars up there. They're right. gone. They're. But the truth is, they're not gone. You just can't see them. Yeah. But if you want, if you desire, if you're willing to put in the time, and you wait 12 hours, they'll come back. Patience. Patience. So here we go back to another element in this equation. You're looking at fear, you're looking at love, now you're looking at patience. And desire. And desire. And desire. You have to want it. You have to want it. You have to want something yeah. bad enough to be willing to go into the cave mm -hmm. and face that dragon. The, the little guy that I was talking to that I was going to beat the daylights out of, uh, you know, his, uh, her name is Taisha, and she a, she's a, came out to be a very beautiful woman. And this is, they just had their second child. In three years, they've had this, the second one. And, uh, and I just, I look at him, and he's driving in like a 2005 or 6 Lexus, you know, which is a nice car, 2007, in the Lexus Coupe. And he's happy. And I asked him, he said, well, what happened? He said, I grew up. Mm -hmm. Good for him. That was his whole answer. I grew up. We've enjoyed having you today. I love you very much. Uh, How about that? Thank you so much, Charles. All right. Thank you, Tina. Oh, and can you put out your information for anyone? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a couple of things. Um, if you're interested in kind of taking a quick uh, overview of where you are on your own path to making your Dream Story Come True, you can go to www.dreamstoryquiz.com and there's a, a real cool little four minute quiz that you can take to give yourself a little bit of a benchmark on where you are. And if you want to know more about the work that I do, you can go to shannonpresson.com, that's P-R-E-S-S-O-N, and uh, I'd love to hear from you. Feel free to email me. You can reach me at shannon at shannonpresson.com or Get on my web page. I'd, I'd love to check out. And thank you so much, Charles. It was just an absolute delight. This was the fastest two hours I think I've had in a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> and as always, be sure to check thoughtsofacommand.net where you can get caught up with the podcast and see a video. Amen. Mercy. <laughs> and that's a wrap. See you Bye. next week. Bye. Amen. Later.